Thank you, Peter. Thank you to all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak openly, freely in front of all of you. When Court Mark approached me, I was a bit nervous. You know, I said, will you like to hear what I'll say? Because something may not please you. And that's what I am. I'm here to provoke you, to stimulate your thinking, and see how we can address this global issue and global problem. So I have been told to talk about appropriate assistive technology in low medium income countries. So I made this presentation followed the some structure of this workshop actually focus on the need and what we mean by appropriate assistive technology, service delivery mechanism, and human resource development, policy and funding, research and evidence, and at the end, the conclusion. So, so let me talk about the need, emerging need, an unmet need. So one billion people with disability now, I'm sure most of you have seen the World Report on Disability, which we published and we said that there's one billion disabled people now, and there will be 1.4 billion disabled people by 2050. 700 million older people now, and 2 billion by 2050. At least 80% of them need assistive devices. Some need more than one. More you need, you need more number of assistive devices. So what we say that at least 1 billion assistive devices now, and nearly 3 billion by 2050. Are we ready for this? See the, how the whole demography is going to change. Now it's a less visible, less older people than the disabled people, but gradually by 2030, 2040, there will be more older people than the disabled people. And we know in most high income countries, majority of the assistive devices users are not disabled people, they're older people. So we have to look the whole assistive technology in more global health perspective or in general population perspective rather than focusing only people with disabilities. So this is what our caption is. We are trying to develop a global movement on this. See one in five now, one in three by 2050. Are we ready? Are we aware of this? Every house will have some older person will have some functional loss and need assistive technology. Are you ready for this? Today, problem is more acute in low and mid-income countries. Only 5 to 15 percent people in need can access assistive devices. Many, and when you have a child with disability, and child grows when it's small, it's easy for the mother to handle, take care. But as they grow, it's difficult for the whole family. And eventually, the whole family becomes disabled. It's not only the child who has disability. Availability and the cost are two major barriers of this poor access rate. Most of the low and mid income countries, these assistive devices are not available. And if they are available, the cost is beyond the reach of the majority. This was a slide from Zambia. Uh, no, this was from Malawi, where the, in the rural areas, the visible people are really struggling to get an assistive devices. 
Now, what do we mean by appropriate assistive technology? WHO and International Society for Prosthetics and Orthotics, we define first time what do we mean by appropriate technology. It is a system providing proper fit and alignment based on sound biomechanical principles which suits the needs of the individual and can be sustained by the country at the most economical and affordable price. And based on this, we try to work on a definition of appropriate assistive technology. It's the assistive technology which suits the need of the individual and their environment and can be available and maintained in the country at an affordable price. So it is a broad scope, but ultimate bottom line is that it should be available in the country, it should be maintained in the country at an affordable price. This is what we trying to promote the concept of 5A by Q. So any appropriate assistive technology should be acceptable, it should be accessible, it should be adaptable, it should be affordable, it should be available, and top most important, it has to be quality. You cannot just give any assistive devices of poor quality. It can create further problems rather than assisting any person. Ultimately, what does it mean? It should be fit for the purpose, suit the, suits the need of individual and their environment. If most, many assistive devices are quite commonly given into the low and mid income countries, especially the wheelchairs and all, those are neither suitable for the individual, nor suitable for the environment they live in. So within a month, you will see the front casters out, or the wheelchair are not in use. So in this part of this girl, she really carries the water from her nearest tap point, 300 meters away from her house, and takes the water in this muddy road. And that's what assistive technology should do. Really assist to be like others, to be any other family member. And technology has to be simple and maintenance free. If there is a lot of component of element of maintenance, repair, that technology has no future in the low mid income countries. Advanced technology should not mean high cost technology. I think we, many of professionals are quite obsessed with this, that higher the technology, higher the cost, higher the status. It's a sickness of mind. The highest technology should be which, is, which benefits the majority, not the benefits the minority. That's the challenge. How we can take really technology advanced so that it benefits the 90% population, if not 100%. And it has to be simple. If it is complicated, professionals are a rare commodity in the, most of the developing world. It has no scope to survive in those countries. So this is a girl in Palestine, refugee camp in Jordan. She has a very low cost, local, low vision class. But that helps her to be in the school. The whole service provision system of the infrastructure required to deliver the assistive devices should have less infrastructure requirements. If it requires heavy infrastructure, it's not going to work. I was quite impressed yesterday when Coach showed me that he puts 10 workstations in one suitcase and takes to the rural areas. That's what I used to do in my early life. I used to have a two, that kind of suitcase with old prosthetic orthotics workshop. So I could go anywhere and set up my prosthetic orthotics facilities and serve the people. But nowadays people talk of cat cam and all, which doesn't work in this part of the world, and people who wants that to work in that part of the world. So here is a, again a 
Palestine refugee camp in uh, Unura in Jordan, where the local girls has been trained how to make a hearing aid fitted to individuals' requirement. And that's how the second generation of professionals come into the play and they can do a lot of work because we don't have audiologists and those experts, ENT specialists in every country and that to everywhere. Rapid fit. Technology should be rapid. People come, ideally I used to say, if they come in the morning for an orthosis, prosthesis, by the evening they should go back with it. People think I'm crazy and mad. Many prosthetic orthotics professionals hate me. They say, no, no, you have to do this trial today, check out tomorrow, get training day after, 10, 20 visits. And they don't come. Any developing world, you go to the prosthetic orthotics gate lab or the trial room, you'll see hundreds of unfinished products. People came for gate training one day, two day, and they don't come. They can't come. We professionals don't understand why they can't come. Because many of them are the daily wage earner. When they come, they lose their daily income. And they can't come alone, they come with another family members. So it costs twice, thrice, four times sometimes. And many people, they get tired. So the technology has to be so rapid fit kind of technology that people come within a day or two, they should get their device. And that's the challenge for us, how we can make that possible. Ensure local repair and maintenance facilities. You have to ensure whatever technology we are talking about in the low income countries or the technology what we are transferring, it should be locally repairable and maintained. In this photo, you know, this, uh, this girl from Mozambique, she came to Sweden for a, some exchange visit. And he's my friend. And in every center he was, she was visiting, everybody felt pity on her. How crude a elbow crutch she is using. So by the time, in two weeks' time, she collected about 20 elbow crutches. <laughs> and my friend is trying to push her, that, saying, how bad is your crutch? It's a primitive, it doesn't work. Take this, we have, from Sweden we have given you 20 crutches. And when she flew back, she didn't take any of those. Because those are all aluminium. She cannot repair in her house, in her home country. This is the metal's MS pipe. So if anything goes wrong, she can go to any local sh welding shop to get it repaired. So people have to think everything in, before we really advise somebody that this is the best solution for you. Because we don't live in the ideal world. Everybody do not live in the ideal world. Make use of locally available materials. They may not be the best. This is a photo from the Solomon Island. This cast was taken in 2011. And more than one year it's waiting on the workbench because the plaster of Paris has to come from Australia. And I said to him, there's no building in your Solomon Island? Yeah. Don't do, the, do any plastic painting? Yeah. They don't do any plastic party before the painting? Yes. So get that plaster from there. They didn't believe me because they have been told it has to come from Australia or Germany. I gave money from my pocket. I said, okay, go and buy five kilo. And I showed him, poured him, and next day he was surprised that it can work. I know in my early days one workshop in Bangladesh was set up by the top people from the US. And the workshop closed down after three, four years because they were waiting for resin to come from Germany, PVA to come from America, some other pigment has to come from Australia. 
and never it came together, all came by one by one. And whenever you used to get the, by the time you used to get the PDA, the resin is out of, stock, out of debt. So you have to keep this in mind, make use of, make use of locally available components as much as possible, even if they are not the best or fancy enough, but those will sustain. So the service delivery models, what are the different way of service delivery we can think of? Look beyond clinics and comfort zone. This is the rehab center in China on your foot on the left. And the rehab facility is in the 15th or 16th floor of that hospital. But majority of the people live in the villages. And where is the connection? How those people can access the services from these big hospitals, big clinics? So we have to develop some mechanism, capital to community, big cities to the community, hospital to home. We have to see there is a gap between the people's house and the hospital gets reduced. From, we have to reduce the gap between institute-based rehabilitation and the community-based rehabilitation. Otherwise, you'll never be able to reach to the majority. Make services available closer to the community. Embrace community-based rehabilitation or any kind of community-based program, community-based initiative. You have to go to the people. Don't wait for the people to come. As I said, they do not come. Early identification and early intervention is the key. More you do early intervention, it's more cost effective for everybody. It's much, much beneficial for the family and the child who goes through all this. And go to the community rather than waiting for people to come. We have a severe program in many developing countries. So wherever you set up, the rehab program, assistive devices, service provision program. Look around. Who does see they are in na neighboring state, district, or community? And tie up. You don't have to do everything yourself. Tie up. And then you can ensure that more people can get the benefit. And look beyond assistive devices. Many people give the pieces of the wheelchair or assistive devices. And we have seen plenty of those wheelchairs, even don't go inside their house, don't go inside the toilet. So it collects all the rain and the dust. So make sure that whenever you give assistive devices, you need to see that environment is accessible and people can do this. And this is where we stress lot of gait training, lot of therapy, you can do at home. You don't have to come to the city in the big clinics to do it. And this is much more cost effective than the way we are doing now. Another big issue, you know, in many service providers, we come with our own luggage, you know. I'm a prosthetist. Okay, I start a prosthetics program here. I'm a wheelchair, I start a wheelchair program there. I'm a hearing, I'm a... And people come and then in the small <coughs> countries where the resources are limited, you cannot go to different, 10, 20 different places for different need. So try to see how you can harness all this and try to come with a single window approach so that all kind of assistive devices can be available from one place as much as possible. How we can ensure that people with have a multidisciplinary skills rather than I'm a specialized orthodist, I'm a specialized prosthetist, I'm a specialized hearing aid. It doesn't work. We can't sustain the doctors and nurses in the developing world. How we can sustain this kind of super professionals? And developing world need more jack of all trades than the masters. 
We need people with the multi skills and who can do. And we are talking nowadays in the World Health Organization, think of task shifting. What you can do if somebody else can do it, keep the task, train them, supervise them, and that way you can reach more people. The human resource development, another big issue on this, we need to have an appropriate human resource development. The dot on the left is the total health professionals we have in the world. And we have to, this small group has to take care of this large circle of 7 billion people, which will become 9 billion people. Take it from me, even if you increase the circle on the left, two times, three times, four times, you'll never be able to reach to all. In 1978, WHO, UNICEF, Almata declaration, we said, health for all. We are 2013, now we are talking in 2015 post-MDG discussion that we should come again another goal in universal coverage of health. But unless and until we change our practice, we said in the Almata that we should have health for all by doing this, this, this. But we have not done it. And as we have not done it, we have not achieved health for all by 2000. So we have to see why we are failing and how we can change our current practice to really become useful for the whole world. And what we are saying that within 7 billion people now, there could be a lot of resources. We don't have to do everything by the professionals. There can be done a lot of things by the family members, any of them do it, and the neighbors or some experts. And we need different level of human resources, you know. We need a postgraduate, graduate, certificate, even non-certificates. We need different level. Everybody doesn't need to go to a specialist and ensure gender balance. Health professionals are heavily male-dominated world, especially the prosthetics and orthotic sector. Many women, especially in the countries with orthodox background, religious background, they don't want their female to be measured by a male, to be assessed by men. We said, we have to come, we have to do, you know, we don't care. But this is, this kind of, Insensitivity doesn't help us long. And that's what we always promote. There should be more women in the health workforce than the men. And they're much better. Make use of all available resources. Make use of, if you think this is only I know, and I can do it, we'll not be able to reach not even 5-10 percent population. We have to make use of all available resources, doctors, nurses, rehab personnel, health workers, severe workers, family, community members. The trick is how we can find who can do some of our work under our supervisory guidance so that we can be useful for the more people. In this part in, in Iran, uh, for every 500 family, there's a family health house, village health house is there. And they maintain all the records from the people. And these are village health workers. They have been trained how to take care of the visible people's simple needs. And when they should contact the higher officials from the district or resources to come for the necessary intervention. So they have demystified the whole rehabilitation and disability intervention quite a bit. So the knowledge is available at the village health workers level. So they know if any child is born, they do the screening in three days, within the three days of their birth. And if they see something wrong, they report to the nearest district hospital. Encourage peer support. However great professionals we are, I have seen from my experience, 
that a user can influence another user much, much better than a professional. So in this, you know, the guy on the left is a physiotherapist. He has a spinal cord injury and he trains other spinal cord injury people. And this guy makes, always attracts more attention than any other professionals I know, you know. Because he is a physiotherapist, he is in the wheelchair, he knows everything. And that makes lots of difference. So the thing is, do we need master level of professionals to make simple ankle foot orthosis? I'll just give an example, AFO. Or to teach daily living skills or quadriceps strengthening exercise. Especially in this part of the world, every day I come, I hear people are upgrading. Before it was a certificate, then it was a baccalaureate, now masters. So the professions here are upgrading and the health support for those services are going down. So there is an imbalance somewhere. Previously, physiotherapy, occupational therapy used to get more money from the health system. Now in Switzerland, we get less and less money. But one hand, we are bringing the professionals up, another hand, we are putting the money down. So as a result, what will happen? People have to make more out-of-pocket payment, and then they will not do it. So we'll gradually go towards the developing world. So we have to really think, does everybody need professionals? Can some other can some of those jobs can be done by a lower level people? Five is the policy and funding. It's a very important issue. No policy, nothing will work. Quite often these policy makers, policy implementers, and the right holders are in the different poles, North Pole, South Pole. Policy makers they think. My job is only to make policy, whether it works or doesn't work, is not my head. <laughs> Implementers say, oh, these are the idiots, they sit in the air-conditioned room somewhere in the UN, they make the policy they don't understand. And the beneficiaries do not understand anything, any of whatever comes, we take it. So, the trick is that how we can bring all these three stakeholders together and have a policy with adequate budget allocation. In the low mid income countries, I have seen enough policy. There is everything fine on the paper, but there is no budget allocation. No budget allocation and a policy is just a piece of paper. So, if, so we have to ensure whenever we talk about the policy, it should have adequate budget allocation. This is many of my colleagues, you know, the rehab professionals, they don't think this is their job to be part of this policy, politics, global advocacy and all this. But if you don't, if you're not part of it, a part of it, you'll be excluded. This is what is happening now. There's a high level meeting on disability and development discussion is going on. And I don't think any of the professionals are taking part in those discussions. And as you are not taking part in those discussions, so the, whatever the, your business, core business, is not getting mentioned there. And as it will not get mentioned there, there will be no funding. So we complain that we don't have fund, but we don't try to analyze why don't we have fund. Because we do not know how to sell our product. Here is an in Pacific example. In the, we brought the 16 Pacific countries together, service providers, government officials, policy makers, rehab professionals, and the users together, and developed a Pacific rehabilitation policy, which is now a mandate for the, all the Pacific countries to follow in the Pacific, including the donors. So donors also put the money. Okay, if you follow this, there is the money to this policy implementation. This is one of my favorite slides. The slide on the left is a very advanced transfemoral prosthesis. And the cost of that 
prosthesis is the, exactly the picture on my right. That's the cost of my house. I spent exactly that amount to make my house. So if the choice comes whether you make a you buy a prosthesis or you buy a house, in developing world, I do not know this part much, but in the developing world, 99% population will go for house because they think it's not their problem. The whole family will benefit of a house rather than a prosthesis. And I do not understand what is this in that thing that it costs much more than a Mercedes car. I have to learn more on this technology. The cost has to be affordable. It doesn't matter whether individual pays, insurance pays, state pays. Even the US government, think about it, the way the health cost is increasing every day, you will have trouble if you are not paying any attention to this. And look at the assistive devices per unit cost. If it is a $10 a piece, we are talking about $10 billion investment. If you're talking about $100 a piece, we are talking about $100 billion and $1,000 a piece, which is quite common assisted hearing aid cost or average cost in the US. That means we are talking about $1 trillion and 2050, we are talking about $3 trillion. Do you think it will happen? And another issue is this product and service provision, you know, there is no balance between sometimes the product costs 10 times higher than the service provision, sometimes service provision costs 10 times higher than the product. You have to bring some balance in this. And this is what I believe that $1 for product, $1 for service provision can make the service sustainable. If it is not, then good luck. This is what, uh, I hope there is no audiologists here, they will kill me. <laughs> and this is what we, I have understood, that many parts of the high income countries, that $1,000 hearing aid, when it comes to the user, it comes, costs them $6,000. There are so many layers in between. And your insurance or health company, health insurance, they pay certain percentage of it and rest of this out of pocket payment if you want to have a quality hearing aid. And some Nordic countries, they told me I can get one from the state, but one I have to buy. So I always go for one because I don't buy. So you have to really see that, is it really that hearing aid should cost $6,000? Cannot we make, does everyone has to go to the specialist? I was telling Peter, I went to the optometrist, ENT, eye specialist for my eyeglasses, only when I went for the fifth glasses. Before I went to the local shop, I was going for 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. Only when I crossed one, I went to a really, to the eye specialist to check my eyes and really get it. So if I have a 10% hearing loss or 20% hearing loss, do we have to go through all these layers? Can't we have some ready-made P set hearing aids and see whether it helps me or not? And can't I have it at a one-tenth of the price? This is another very interesting comparison, what I say. The Cable connection and the dish antenna and all this. Now, my colleague in, in India, what they pay and what I pay in Switzerland is 60 times more. Okay? But the cable operator makes much more profit than the guy in the Switzerland because he has 600 times more clients than the Swiss people. So if we can really ensure that our number of the people who receive these services is increased, we can bring the cost down. And if we can bring the cost down, more people will benefit and the supplier still will make the same amount of profit. So we have to think a little differently 
innovatively that how we can really work on this cost. If the cost is not low, we will never be able to reach to the majority. Research and evidence based practice. Is there enough research in this field? If you do this lead search in uh, all this PubMed and all, you'll find there are about 8,000 articles on assistive technology. And if you connect it with that and developing countries, there will be only 30 articles. And then you add human rights or development, only three articles on human rights and 10 articles on overall all this mix of human rights and development. But if you look at the communicable disease, non-communicable disease, HIV AIDS, thousands of the research paper. So they know how to make a case for Millennium Development Goals, how to, make a, how to get money from the development for the research in the field of rehabilitation. We do not know. We don't have evidence. We can quite often my friends say that, you know, this knee is giving 5% more stability than this knee. So what does it matter if paying $50,000, 5% more? But does any research that this knee is helping this person to go out of poverty, their family to go out of poverty, and this kind of intervention is taking country out of poverty? This kind of big piece research, how many assistive devices are actually helping people children to access education, adults to make income. Those kind of big pieces of research are quite a bit missing. And that's why we, I think we are failing to get the money from the mainstream development. So in conclusion, assistive technology is a very small market at present. A handful manufacturers, manufacturers whether it's a hearing aid, prosthesis and orthosis, it's so, all 8 to 10 companies and they dictate what the price should be. It's not the users, not the professionals. And if any new company comes, we buy it, so we take them out of the business so I can decide what price I should put. Higher cost, higher status. And fragmented sector, again, hearing groups award separately, wheelchair groups separately, mobility devices groups separately, and as a result only 3 to 25 percent global access to assistive devices. These are the common challenges for the, but there are opportunities as Peter was saying, there are some opportunities, people's understanding is increasing. Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities is creating a big opportunity at least there are four articles on the convention is quite a bit dedicated on assistive devices. And there is also a greater need due to the emergence of, as Peter was said, non-communicable diseases, conflict, road traffic injuries, and most importantly, aging. Keep this aging in your head. All our resources will go in that sector in coming years. Technological advancement, you see iPhone 5 now or Galaxy S4, so every day technology is advancing. An emergence of other economies like Brazil, China, Russia, India, South Africa. So there are other economies that are coming up so that, and best thing what I like is economic recession. I'm sure many of you will kill me for this. <laughs> I like economic recession. I think plenty of wealth is creating plenty of problems. And I see it in my own home. My sons are, I think, less innovative than I was because I had nothing and they have everything. So they have spent most of the time on the Xbox and PlayStation. The current trend of copy-based technology transfer from the North will never work in the South as realities are different. This is in the Dakar, Senegal. They have exported all the Japanese technology and the components in Dakar. Some of these technology materials will not survive even that temperature. Non-communicable 
northern solution is not sustainable in north. How can it succeed in south? You cannot say in the north everybody who needs assistive devices has one. We know they don't have. Only again in the big cities, people have. People write to me time to time. My problem was much better when I was in Boston, I was in DC and all. Now I have moved to rural areas in the US and there is nothing. So many times you pack things from US or Europe to these countries. Sometimes because of the voltage or even the plug configuration, they lie there. It's in the in the Dhana workshop, it's lying there for the last three, four years. Nobody opened it because they have no use for this. So sometimes you have to really see what you are giving and whether it makes sense. Southern solution with necessary modification would be good for the whole world. What, this is an example of solar year. We started in Botswana, now in Brazil, now they're in India. So the hearing aid is coming up different digital hearing aid, solar charger or non-solar charger at an affordable price and people are going for it because even if you have to do out of pocket payment you just pay three to five million dollars. So what I am saying that southern solution with necessary modification will be good for the whole world. This is another example, you know, WHO produced these wheelchair guidelines and I'm happy to see some of the back. And if you notice that wheelchair guidelines, the cover was manual wheelchairs for the less resource settings. And as we investigated more in this and we understood there's not much difference in to the developing between the developing world and developed world on the wheelchair provision. The knowledge about wheelchair provision is same whether it's in the developing world or the developed world. So then we developed this training package and we remove this low resource settings of the developing countries. And now I get more requests from America or Australia for this training package than Botswana or Namibia. And there's an American group now, as all the PTOTs of America, they have formed a group to introduce this training package into the different universities of US running PTOT programs. So, what you, there are a lot of advantage and economic recession and emerging need will force everyone to look for alternatives. If you think you are safe, you have a lot of resources today, you don't have to worry, things will change because of this emerging need. We are talking from 1 billion to 3 billion. And look at South. There are some good examples, all are not bad in South. There are some good examples, some good things which you can take it from South. So food for thought. I call it reverse thinking. You always think like this. Think it from up, bottom up. Call it reverse thinking. Jesus Christ, Allah, Buddha, whether Gandhi, Mandela, or Dalai Lama, all came from South. Thank you very much. <laughs>
My name is Mary McGowan. I'm with President's Outreach Foundation, and I agree wholeheartedly with everything that you said there in terms of sustainability. We work, um, our whole approach is about that, working in the low and middle income countries and finding local solutions with local materials and, and appropriate technology. The issue, of course, is the funding side. So it's great to see that there is a proponent higher up who can really push that agenda. But how would you suggest that we kind of get that type of um, information out there so people, are, I mean, is it just the research? Should we really invest in that? Or is there other, other things that we can do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, research is one piece. It's a, like a, it's a politics. You have to see how the medicines is going to the developing countries. We have to learn from the different examples how things have changed in the low and mid income countries, mainstream development. But what we understand, research is one place, peace, some champions. You need the champions in your country. You need somebody with a closer, some, somebody in their family has some disability. It works like a miracle. You know, when I came to the sector, China was 25 years behind India. And, up, and now they're 25 years of, ahead of India. And one person, the president's son, he was paraplegic. He made that difference. So don't quote me this, but we need champions. We need champions we need ambassadors, we need professionals, we need UN, we need even the manufacturers. We are trying to tell manufacturers, look, in the medicine, in the drug world, what they do, there is a unit in the WHO called Unit Aid. They buy the bulk medicine from Novartis and big companies, as they buy in millions, so they can get the price down by one tenth. So even the hearing aid groups has told me that if you buy a million hearing aid, that $1,000 hearing aid we can give you in $100. So we have to find different mechanism how we can ensure that we can still have the same quality but at an affordable price. And we need everybody to work together. And with the research, with evidence, your case makes become more stronger. Okay, the question comes from Evelyn Chirot, and it is Chappelle. Our rehab policy was on the back burner as PWD's leading CRPD implementation. Uh, we're advocating for more funding for DPO empowerment funding, needed but also fostering an anti-medical model premise. Recently, rehab and healthcare services has received some attention for UN policy integration with post policy with post uh, 2015 MDG agenda planning, it has been difficult for new actors of rehab personnel to play roles in MDG related systems change and capacity building policy and program development. How do you suggest rehab professionals gain a voice in the UN process and nation's disability planning and implementation? Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. I, I know you, so I, I'm not surprised with this question. <laughs> so, you have to see who are the prime movers on this discussion. Is the member states and the disabled people's organizations. UN, DESA, WHO, UNICEF, we are on the sideline. We do have some but actually people who can make difference is the member states, the countries, government, and the disabled people's organization. So the real professional has to talk to these two groups and try to see that what they are doing that gets included there. But to do that, you have to really make a case that they believe you. Because many times, many disabled people's 
organization, they don't believe you. Because they think you want to make money out of their disability. But you have to really have the allies and the friends who will understand actually you don't make money out of their life, you contribute in their life. And if you can prove that, they will be your big ambassador. And it is these disabled people and their organizations, they, if you really can develop a relationship strong, together you can make the difference. But you alone, I don't think you can do it. people who ask questions, the others know the answer, that's what I believe. So, I think both parties right, you know, the both sides is right. And that's what the, I think, again, we have to come together, the both sides group, the people who are going to transfer those tasks and the people who are going to take those new tasks and can, can come to some kind of an understanding this is what I can do, and this is where I need your support. And that kind of a discussion, I think, quite WHO is quite pushing in many countries because we have realized that WHO's norms is that you should have at least 23 health professionals per 1,000 population, and many developing world is not anywhere even in two digits. So. So what's the alternative? And another big problem what we are facing is the migration of the health workforce. Most of the professionals in many countries in Africa, they don't stay there even soon after their graduation, they leave the country. So what's the alternative? So one hand the professionals has to really see how we can make our population serve. At the same time, I'm not saying that all those people can do everything what you can do. Those mid-level workers are the, not the replacements of the professionals. They are the extended arms and legs of the professionals. Like that you have a physical uh, medical assistant in the US, like uh, many doctors, people. In South Africa, the nurses, they do quite a bit of the job of medical doctors. So, it's, but, they are the only people, you know, who, who are closer to the community, where the people come there, and they make a decision what they can do at their level and what they should refer to the doctor. So I think you have to draw some kind of a line in between that what you can do, what you cannot do, and that should be again based on consensus. If, uh, but many times we have found that we are so rigid we don't want to transfer this, and at the same time we can't do it. This is the problem with my many professional groups, association, I don't want to name them. They said, no qualification, nobody should be allowed to touch a patient if they're not trained four years or six years on this. I said, fine, I fully agree, but make those people available there. I work in countries sometimes, in Tajikistan, there was a polio outbreak in two years ago, two, three years ago. The whole country has no physiotherapist. Whole country has no rehab doctor, so what I should do? So 
this task shifting and all this coming, why? Because we have failed to play our role properly. We have failed to see that some of our skills are transferred to the larger group so that larger people can access the healthcare. So this is where I think all the group has to sit together and see that what other tasks can be shifted. And in South Africa, actually, we have tried to work with the Stellenbosch University to develop a cadre of multidisciplinary rehab professionals who has this kind of skill. Because otherwise, everything is fine in Cape Town. You go 20 kilometers out of Cape Town, nothing. There was one hand here before. Okay, yeah. Um, hi, so this is from Mr. Atanyaki, I believe. Uh, and he says, hi, I'm from Sri Lanka. Uh, my personal experience with assistive devices relates to my husband, who is in a wheelchair. Uh, who is a wheelchair user, and also a user of a special course in Tuscus Scoliosis. True, there are locally developed products, but our experiences have, have always been that the quality is low. Most of the time, the experience is very uncomfortable. Therefore, we end up looking for imported devices which are much more expensive. How can the quality of locally developed products be improved? It is often understood that high quality raw materials and technology matter a lot. Comfort means a lot a lot to a person who has to use an assistive device 24-7. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I completely understand the question and the issue. Uh, technology is, is good if the users of the technology is equally good. Many times we have seen many of these components come or the technology comes and users have no skills to handle those technologies in this. And, and then it becomes a more mess, you know. Because intelligent prosthesis knee, intelligent knee in the prosthesis transfemoral, they have sold more knee unit in India than in UK. But the people who are making those, I'm not sure they have the same skills. And it's, your personal skill makes a lot of difference of this and especially for Sri Lanka, I know the situation uh, quite well because I traveled across Sri Lanka from Gaul to Jaffna several times and there is a new prosthetic orthotic schools have come up, so new trained professionals are coming up and I am sure the issue what she has mentioned, in a, within a year or two the problem will be much lesser. But again, the issue is that who pays for it? If, and we believe that if, if the people has the capacity, then the technology should be able to answer their need. And I hope in Sri Lanka very soon those technology will be available because now there are formal three year, four year training programs in prosthetics and orthotics. So I'm sure they will be able to produce quality spinal orthosis and uh, also in Sri Lanka, there is a huge presence of motivation wheelchair program, so maybe they, together with this prosthetic orthotic school, can solve part of your problem. One more question. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Randy Earl, and uh, I'm a wheelchair user and also an advocate uh, trying to increase access for people with disabilities. And um, I feel like the power of having professionals with disabilities is unquestioned. Um, but I also feel like within at least uh, modern medicine in the developed world, there's really a double standard in that it's okay for me to be the patient, but for me to be the professional is a whole nother story. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about how, how we can change that. Thank you. You know, the, I think you, law is in your hand. There is a lot of law and the convention now 
is going to support you to claim your rights. So because of your disability, people cannot deprive you from acquiring any professional skills. And there are some court cases that gone up to the Supreme Court on this and people got a favorable uh, I know a few of my colleagues in the uh, USA who are in wheelchair and they are medical doctors and one is really a professional. So things are changing but you know this uh, prejudice is everywhere. It's a long culture, religion, all has it's their role we play. So things will change and that's why we need positive role models and more advocates like you that say look it is possible and we can do it. And, it, and more people we see in the mainstream, more disabled people we see in the mainstream service profession, I think that things will change quite drastically and it will change quite fast. And that's what I think assistive technology, when some people has if some difficulties to perform the job like others, but assistive technology can play quite a bit of add-on values to ensure that they are at par with others. And I, I'm sure, I'm very optimistic, things will change. Things change. So thank you very much.